We return to Blake 7 with the crew now enjoying their new ship, the Liberator, so named because it will liberate them, or because they stole it. Take your pick. But working together, they've managed to sort things out, and can even fly the ship manually if Zen decides to ignore them, though it takes a great deal of coordination, coordination that can only come from five people who are stuck with each other. I think we make a good team. Well, hooray for us. Avon is the morale officer. He has a good reason to be cynical, though. He knows what Blake is plotting. Not to hide from the Federation, but to mess with the good. Things are naturally uncomfortable between the two of them. Avon detests that Blake's presuming to do what he likes and that they'll just fall into line, and Blake can't stand Avon's attitude. Admittedly, Blake is a bit of a tool. Even Jen is not sold on the idea of a one-ship war against the Federation, so he lets them know they can leave any time that they like. Look, we're fighting a war here, fighting for freedom, for self-determination, and for democracy. So all of you shut up and do whatever I tell you, damn it! They're on their way to Saurian Major when Blake starts explaining his plan. The world was brutally smashed when they tried to rebel, but there's a small band of rebels in the hills, and the Federation has a transceiver array on that planet that's a real plumb target. With that out, they'll be blind, deaf, and dumb. A blow for freedom. Yes, our freedom. For a clever man, you're not very bright. Deaf, dumb, and blind, how are they going to catch us? I'm sure Blake will manage it somehow. Even as the morale officer, but I never said it was his job to improve it. On the way, Zen picks up an artificial projectile of some kind, probably a ship. It's adrift in space and broadcasting a distress signal, so they had to go on and check it out, but after letting them know it's there, Zen seems rather uncooperative. But he's not doing so maliciously, so Gan speculates that perhaps there's some kind of limiter in place that keeps Zen in check. Meanwhile, Blake and Jenner are going to check out the ship via teleport, where after a bit of exploring they realize that the crew, if you can call it that, is in cryogenic suspension, so they'll need to thaw them out to get some answers. And we need answers, because otherwise we're always going to wonder, won't we? The only problem is that the air is running out there, and they can't teleport them back because one of the relays in the system burned out. And of course, the warranty doesn't apply if you sell, transfer, or steal the vehicle, so they're screwed there. What's more, Zen is being quite uncooperative. So without the teleport and no autopilot, the only choice now is to try to bring the capsule in by maneuvering the Liberator manually. Now they did just prove that they can do that. Except it was thanks to a team effort with an expert pilot giving the orders. That expert pilot being Jenna, the one who's on the capsule. So this is really not shaping up to be Blake's day. They're facing certain mortal danger between the lack of oxygen or the piling skill of a man who doesn't like him in the first place. And they actually haven't reached Zorian Major yet. This could wind up being the shortest revolution in history. Under Avon's leadership, the trio managed to get the ship on board and save Blake and Jenna. It's funny that Avon wound up in prison and had things go wrong whenever he relies on other people, and yet despite his personality, he's a rather effective leader when you get down to it. Hence why he and Blake butt heads so often. It's not that he thinks he'd do a better job than Blake, although he probably does think that, but a fundamental disagreement in what they're doing and a quality that Blake can't keep contained by his own leadership. It's a sort of an alpha male clash, but not quite. It's not that Avon demands to lead so much as he resists being forced to follow. A more thorough look through the ship suggests that this was a one-way trip by desperate people. Nothing for taking off once it's landed. Sublight engines meaning an incredibly long interstellar journey. No frills like defensive systems or even a proper life support system. Almost as bad as U.S. Airways. While those guys are thawing out, the ship arrives at Saurian Major, so Blake heads down with an unhappy villa and an irritated Avon. The villa at least seems intrigued by the local plant life. Have to be careful with the plant life around here. Some of it's carnivorous. Some species even have an intelligence rating. Well, that's a comfort. I should hate to be eaten by something stupid. Speaking of which, let's get to Blake's plan. He thinks that he, the best way to make contact here is to set up a camp and just wait for the rebels to find them. His reasoning is that if they were any good, then they would have noticed their arrival. Of course, the Federation should be just as likely, if not more so, to find them with this plan, since if there are rebels who are doing anything worth talking about, then the Federation forces will regularly be looking for their presence, and thus stumble across Blake and his team. 
Now, they attempt to hand wave this away by saying that the Federation won't patrol so far out from their base. So apparently they don't care how rebellious the rebels get, so long as they're not doing anywhere where I have to look at it. And not to mention that this would leave the place wide open for pirates and smugglers and whatnot to make use of this planet for their illicit activity. I mean, that's why the Liberator hasn't been picked up yet. There's a blind spot. The Federation is evil, and the Federation is powerful, but the most important thing to remember is that the Federation is so lazy. Gan and Jenna discuss things a bit on the Liberator. Of the human characters, Gan gets the least opportunity for character moments over his run, so his quiet discussion with her is a rare bit of insight into this guy who, well, whose primary job is to hit people that Blake says needs hitting. He may be the team big guy, but he is not dumb, as is so often the case. The reason he wound up on that prison ship is not because he's a brute, it's because he killed a security officer who had killed his woman, as he phrases it. What he doesn't mention yet is that the reason a limiter came to mind with Zen is because Gan has one. He can't actually kill anyone deliberately because of a chip wired into his brain. That's why he needs to be around people like Blake who can protect him when his life is threatened and he can't defend himself. Which is why he was damn lucky not to get left on that prison planet. A man who can't kill in self-defense there is a man who's going to wind up his dinner. Well, Jenna heads back to check up on the frozen guys, only it seems one of them broke and the guy spoiled. The second is still frozen in the middle, I guess, so he's still lying there. But the third is up and skulking about, ready for the attack. Can you understand me? We're not going to harm you! Ouch, he hit her back so hard it broke her arm. She can't call for help because even though he has a ship a few thousand years behind the times, he still knows what a comm unit is and has smashed it already. She manages to evade him, not hard when he lopes about like he was trained by the Igor Olympic team. Eventually she manages to lock him inside and then allows Nurse Gan to treat her broken arm with the ship's super medtech stuff. On the planet, Blake's had no luck making contact with the rebels via Operation Just Sit There, but his luck soon changes as a woman shows up and kicks his ass. Who are you? Will you answer my question? Wow, look at that. It can only mean one thing. She's a ventriloquist. That will come in real handy against the Federation. They prepared for armed assailants, but not Woozle's name Peanut. Actually, she's a telepath. Well, after a fashion. She can broadcast her thoughts into someone, which is useful when you... Well, when you have a sore throat, or when you want to talk about someone to someone else, but you don't want them to hear what you're saying. Or perhaps you just want to sing annoying songs into someone's head to amuse yourself. I mean, the possibilities of useless use are endless. But as far as reading the thoughts of others go, well, that's something that she can't do. Hence why she falls for Blake's trick and gets disarmed. At first she thinks they're agents of the Federation, but gradually Callie, that's her name, is a little more open, soon a lot more open, as she realizes that Avon had a gun on her the entire time. The rebellion, it seems, was wiped out, poison gas. Callie's an alien, so it didn't affect her, but she's the only one left now. Back on the ship, Gan isn't reporting in, so Jenna grabs a gun and goes looking for him, only to discover that someone has hooked up the capsule of the ship's power. You know, because power is power, damn it, and hey, there's no more radio shacks to get an adapter, so we're just going to have to make do. One of them jumps at her, but apparently, even though they were advanced enough to make this spaceship, they aren't advanced enough for other technology, like firearms or shirts. So he tries attacking with a knife and gets gunned down for his trouble. But Gan warns that the other one is still on the loose, and that they hate anyone who is not of their own kind. Gotta say, they have a bit of a step down from Terry Nation's last creation that had that characteristic. Back on the planet, the Forsen begin their raid. Callie with her rifle, Blake and Avon with their guns, and Villa with the cooler in case beer is needed to solve this problem. I mean, you never know. They get to the blow-up-this-entire-place room, except that it's locked and the explosion that would take the door down would alert the guards. But that's why Villa is here. He breaks out his tools and they get in just in time for the guards to notice them and make ready with the kicking of their ass, while Avon tries to rig up the destruct before that happens. The problem is that even if he gets it done, Jenna gets jumped by the remaining angry guy, who kicks her good. Not easy when you're wearing sandals, I might add. 
Sandals? Well, yes, you don't want to go into cryogenic suspension with shoes on. You'll wind up with athlete's foot. That's common sense. Gan Semi comes to the rescue. He can't actually shoot the bad guy, though. But it is enough of a distraction for Jenna to get her gun and shoot him. Olak Gan. Basic decoding of projectiles autolog is now complete. Oh, thanks. I'm real curious about that as I lie on the floor. There's one more in there, actually, and he's going to go after Jenna. But that's her problem. The base and the planet's about to go up, and Gan's having his limiter mess with his head, plus getting repeatedly beaten up. But don't worry, everyone, don't worry. The man with the concussion and a microchip in his head is now about to operate the matter transporter. You may now begin screaming. Luckily for Jenna, Blake comes to her rescue just before the last bad guy can stab her with what I'm going to charitably call a knife. Instead, he winds up electrocuting himself, so that problem sorts itself out. The station on the planet is destroyed and the capsule will be dumped into deep space because the genetic banks on board could create an entire adult of those guys in less than two minutes or your money back. And you don't know if those guys are going to be hostile too, so they're going to err on the side of somebody else's problem. And a completely unrelated topic, Jenna is all of a sudden very, very jealous that there is another woman on board. I wonder if she was making eyes at Blake or something. Seems to me it should have taught us something. Something about the wisdom involved in bringing aliens aboard. I'm afraid space regulations are clear that this problem must be resolved with a pillow fight. This is when the title is explained as Blake declares that the seven of them, including Zen, are enough to make this ship run smoothly. Well, run at any rate. As I said previously, the first season has Terry Nation listed as writer, but in reality, Chris B. was taking Nation's plots and turning them into actual scripts. So Time Squad is a failure for Nation, but a success for Chris B. Despite having two plots, the drama itself is very weak, but the character work involved is excellent. A chance to see the growing dynamic and a look into the heads of several of them, plus giving each of them a moment to shine. It's a rare episode that when the action plot takes over, things become tedious, but there it is. The only real exception being the submarine-like command situation as Avon tries to dock Liberator with the capsule. Speaking of Avon, who the hell dressed him this week? I mean, he looks like his clothes were fused with a filthy apron. But yes, the action on the planet was straightforward and uninspired. The plot with the capsule unremarkable in any way. These guides are even more primitive than the ones that we had on the prison planet, you know, as far as menace goes. I mean, th what they really needed to do was make them more of a threat and reveal earlier that they are working to unleash this army of them all, enough to take over Liberator and begin their own assault on the galaxy, and then we have a decent threat. But as presented, they're only a problem because the person in charge of watching them is physically prevented from harming them which is more drama for him and less an emphasis on how dangerous these guys are. But again, that's where the episode's strength lies. Character drama, not plot drama. The crew is now fully assembled, but we've only just begun. There's plenty more Blake 7 yet to come. But for more spacecraft alien planet menace, next week is the classic film Forbidden Planet. All hail the Overlord! All hail the Overlord! Speed and course confirmed. That falls a little short of my idea of a thorough discussion.